Okay, moving on. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, I'm Mick Whitley, MP for Birkenhead. I'm Vice Chair of the Liverpool City Region APPG, and I'm sharing this meeting today in lieu of Kim, Kim Johnson, who will be uh, joining us uh, virtually. I think she's got some uh, other business on in, uh, in, in Liverpool. Uh, at its last meeting, the Liverpool City Region APPG discussed innovation at Narden D in the City Region. And as Mayor Steve Rother noted at the time, the potential of the Liverpool City Region is underpinned not only by the strength of its innovation clusters, but the creation of a new low carbon energy sources in the city region through the Maisie Tidal Power and high net projects. At the same time, April statistics from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy show that 41,297 households in Liverpool alone are experiencing fuel poverty. 18.7% of Liverpool's population. Most of the dwellings in the Liverpool city region only attain an energy performance certificate of band D with the goal of every household attaining band C by 2035. The city region has a huge task ahead. We are pleased that the Heseltine Institute for Public Policy, Practice and Place have produced research on energy in the city region, looking at fuel poverty, innovation in, in, in energy and the city region's potential to build capacity and resilience in its systems. I'm now delighted to hand over to Sue Jarvis, co-director at the Heseltown Institute for Public Policy, Practice and Pace, who will be taking us through this research. Over to you, Sue. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and can we have the, the first slide, um, Louis, please? Um, as, as Chair's just mentioned, we, we circulated a, a short briefing note ahead of this session, really, just to set out some of the key energy challenges facing the city region. And, and it can be argued that, um, you know, we're facing, the UK is facing a multi-dimensional energy challenge. We've got global political and economic trends, including the current conflict in Ukraine, which is disrupting energy markets. And this has resulted in a dramatic increase in the price of oil and gas. In addition, rising food, energy and fuel prices are driving a large increase in the cost of living and are affecting household budgets. And with further rises an anticipated if the energy price cap increases later this year. And a third challenge which we're all familiar with is climate change, but not only to the global ecosystem, but to people, businesses and institutions in the UK. So in the context of, of these challenges, the first step will be to improve energy efficiency, reducing the amount of energy that households and businesses need. But the longer term solution is to address the UK's underlying energy vulnerability by reducing our dependence on imported oil and gas as part of the transition to net zero. So if we could move to the next slide, please, Louis. Um, if, we, if we first of all set the context of, of energy and net zero challenges, within the Liverpool city region. The cost of living crisis is particularly acute and a recent survey by the Combined Authorities Engagement Team found that over three quarters of people in the Liverpool city region were negatively impacted by increases in the cost of living. And fuel poverty was a major problem before the recent rises in inflation with 15.8% of households in the city region being classed as in fuel poverty it back in 20, 2010. And if we consider income levels in the city region, one in five jobs pays below the national living wage. From a climate change perspective, the city region has set an ambitious target to become net zero by 2040. And this is 10 years ahead of the UK target. And as a coastal region, a 1.5 temperature increase would result in significant flooding in rural Sefton and Liverpool. So the challenge we have is to achieve net zero in a fair way, increasing energy resilience, but also achieving prosperity. And the next, through the next few slides, I will just touch on some of the key um, messages to consider. So if we could move to the next slide, please, Louis. Thanks. In terms of fairness, the current energy crisis is severely impacting on, on low-income households, as, as we know. And, and our research paper provides some stark figures from a recent Joseph Rowntree Foundation report of the scale of the issue at a national level. And we know low-income households spend a larger proportion than average on energy and food. 
and they will be more affected by the price rises. So how do we tackle the energy-led cost of living crisis and ensure the transition to net zero is achieved in a just and a reasonable way? Insulating more homes is crucial and half of all non-social housing homes in the Liverpool city region were built before 1940. And 60% 60, 60 of Liverpool city region properties have an energy performance certificate rating of D or below, with A being the most efficient and G being the least efficient. So this makes it difficult to meet our net zero goals in the housing sector, but it also impacts on our residents through higher energy bills and higher rates of fuel poverty, as, as previously noted. So the chart we've got here on, on the slide uh, pre presents some UK data, and it shows how progress on insulating homes has stalled in recent years from a high of around 2.2 million home energy, energy efficiency improvements in 2012. You know, real change in, in, in the, the chart when you look, look at that. So funding is a particular issue and there's an estimated 36 billion required nationally to bring all housing association homes to a minimum EPC rating. And the figure for the private rented sector is likely to be higher than this. So skill shortages and a lack of a national insulation strategy are further barriers for the sector in terms of addressing this challenge. But we've also got other policy areas we need to look to. Um, so the use of public transport and active travel, for example, will also need to increase if we're to meet our net zero ambitions. Next slide, please. So focusing on resilience, a key challenge is how to maximise local climate resilience by delivering adaptations that pre prepare the Liverpool city region for a less stable climate, whilst also leading the way towards rapid decarbonisation. And the UK's Climate Change Committee has registered concerns about the resilience of the UK's energy systems. And we've seen um, various examples of um, storm damage, such as Storm Arwen back in, in November last year, which caused considerable disruption. More locally, rising temperatures, flooding, and other extreme weather events threaten electricity networks in the Liverpool city region. And in terms of our Liverpool city region economy, we have a higher economic output from manufacturing than national average, which means our economy is more energy intensive and potentially more vulnerable to outages. Therefore, maintaining suitable energy supply to what has been called extra large industrial consumers is an important consideration for us in the city region. And a dual approach is needed, reducing energy consumption and maximising the generation of reliable, renewable energy. So here in the Liverpool city region, we are in a, in a stronger position than, than, than many other areas. Local industry and business are innovating ways to improve energy, energy efficiency and reduce carbon emissions. For example, the work that Glass Futures are doing in St Helens. And in terms of our natural assets, the Mersey Tidal Power Project could generate enough power for up to one million homes. Next slide, please. So how do we link this all back to prosperity? We've, we've heard at previous APPG meetings how prosperity in Liverpool City region is regarded as being wider than the traditional measures of economic growth. Um, having said that, despite recent improvements in our economic performance, the city region continues to face several key challenges to meaningful shared prosperity, um, such as high levels of, of deprivation. Pollution is also an issue with air quality in some areas of the city region being very poor. And we also have poor health and wellbeing outcomes, which have consequences for economic opportunity and employment. Having said that, our favourable geography means there are extensive opportunities around the transition to a net zero economy, where we are well placed to lead and benefit from new investment, um, particularly as we, we've been described as the UK's renewable energy coast. And the recent innovation prospectus, which we, we considered at our last meeting, emphasises the opportunities around Mersey Tidal, 
And this in particular offers the chance for the city region to realise the potential for tidal energy, providing a large and reliable source of clean energy for the area. We also have the local offshore wind sector, which is already significant in the city region. And we're home to some of the largest offshore wind farms in the world. Another example, again, um, mentioned in, in the innovation prospectus is Hynet Northwest, which aims to create 75,000 new local jobs by 2035 as one of Europe's largest industrial decarbonisation clusters. So having said all of that, we need to ensure that our residents are able to access these opportunities over the coming years so that we can achieve that prosperity for all. So this then has in turn implications for education, for skills and for partnerships between training providers and employers, amongst others that need to be factored into um, our work going forward. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, I would argue that the scale of ambition and opportunity to simultaneously level up and deliver net zero in the Liverpool city region is there. And this chimes with the latest UK Climate Change Committee report, which is calling for actions to address the cost of living crisis to be aligned with net zero priorities. This report by the Climate Change Committee is also calling for a scaling up of delivery across a, a range of net zero policy areas. And this is where the Liverpool City region is in a strong position to argue its case. So this final slide plays out a range of, of important questions for the APPG to consider as, as part of your deliberations today, um, so that we can ensure that the city region overcomes the cost of living crisis, but also positions itself as a priority for intervention and investment for the transition to net zero. So I will pause there and, and hand back to the, to the chair who will um, move into the next stage of the, the discussion. Thank you. Are you there, Nick? You're on mute. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Sue. That was a fantastic contribution. Uh, I'm now delighted to uh, introduce our panel for today. And uh, first off is uh, Steve Rodham, the Mayor of uh, Liverpool City Region. I've got uh, Mick Blakely, Service Delivery Manager at Liverpool Citizens Advice, Guy Jefferson, Chief Operating Officer of Scottish Power, and Liam O'Sullivan, Director of SP Manweb at Scottish Power. So we'll kick off with uh, Steve, uh, Steve Rotherham. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, if you can keep your contributions for about five minutes, that'll be great. OK, Steve, over to you. I'll do my best, Chair, but there's so much, isn't there? Um, thanks yeah. to Sue for what was a very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I think today's discussion is particularly fitting, isn't it, given the record temperatures that we've just heard of uh, earlier. And it's a stark reminder that addressing the climate emergency is, isn't something that we can put off to 2050. I know there's targets there, or 2040, like ours, or even 2030, to be honest, because the impact's happening right now and we need to take action now. So there are a number of worthy areas for discussion, but in the few minutes I've been allocated, I'll focus on the threats and the opportunities for the Liverpool City region and hopefully dispel one or two myths and falsehoods that are starting to grow around the green agenda. Um, firstly, it's hugely concerning that we're hearing so little from the candidates to be the country's next Prime Minister on the most pressing long-term issue facing the country, which is the existential threat of global warming. And in fact, you know, many seem to be appealing to their base by promising to deprioritize the issue, which I think is incomprehensible and, and incredible at the same time. So for instance, on tidal, it's just been uh, highlighted that we could generate up to a, a, a power up to a million homes in the city region, uh, which has got the potential to create those thousands of jobs, both in its construction, but also when we operate it. And it'll provide our communities with a secure energy supply, but a predictable source of energy going right into the next century and beyond. And it is 
actually cheaper than nuclear over its full life because there's no decommissioning. There's no storage. You've spent fuel rods for many centuries either. So tidal, for me, needs to be just a passing mention in the government's energy strategy, uh, although it was encouraging that the tidal range is being included in the future energy scenarios by National Grid. So that, that's progress, at least. In regard to high net, which Sue touched on, uh, you know, it's an incredible asset it's on our doorstep. And there's a project that is about optimising current industrial processes to extract hydrogen that would otherwise be wasted into the atmosphere. And it's not what some people uh, are perhaps trying to label it as, which is about burning fossil fuels yeah. in themselves with the sole purpose of hydrogen extraction. So it's um, it's not the greenest form of hydrogen. We know that, um, but we can't wait for an absolute clean solution and then decide to build the infrastructure. We need to be doing the infrastructure now. So we're looking to repurpose existing assets such as um, the, the, the gas pipelines, reverse engineer them. So instead of bringing in gas onto the mainland, they flow backwards and store uh, carbon in depleted gas fields in Liverpool Bay. And by 2030, Hynek could produce, reduce sorry, uh, carbon monoxide by about 10 million tonnes every year, which is about 4 million cars off the road. So think about what that could do for us. At the other end, it's been mentioned again about retrofitting. And as Sue said, nearly two thirds of our homes are currently uh, EPC band D or below. But that's an opportunity for us, Chair, to radically reduce our carbon footprint through retrofitting, but also to upskill, to reskill, and to employ many, many more people in the growing sector. And we just need a skills minister who recognises the huge prize that's in front of us. Um, we're doing what we can locally. We've invested £55 million pounds improving the energy efficiency of homes across the city region. But the level of investment needs to be stepped up many times to make a significant dent in the retrofit demand. And just in the last few minutes, um, I'll finally talk about, um, believe it or not, levelling up. <laughs> and um, Although we, we've always thought it's a myth and it might be actually dunked um, by the incoming Prime Minister, there was a commitment to government to increasing domestic um, R&D investment outside of the greater southeast area by at least 40 percent by 2030 and that's going to require a small number of places outside the golden triangle like us um, to outperform current averages so in the city region we've identified three billion pounds worth of r d projects that the government needs to work with us on for these to become a reality and we're leading in the country and possibly the whole world in things like the decarbonisation of energy intensive industries. We've had two successful pilots in Pilkington's and St. Helens and Unilever on the Wirral. And our innovation prospectus, which was flashed up, identifies projects that could generate, and I haven't got the figures wrong here, they, it could generate £42 billion pounds of GBA for our economy and create 44,000 jobs. And that's 44 thousand jobs chair over to you thanks Pete. great stuff uh, i've got now um i'm gonna mention lot of my notes uh mike blakely service delivery manager at liverpool citizens advice over to you mike thanks chair hi everyone thanks for having me my name's mick blakely i'm the service delivery manager for citizens advice liverpool and what i want to talk to you today about is just how we're seeing the energy crisis through our through our advice work so I've been involved with providing energy advice for over 20 years, providing and, and supervising energy advice. And I want to start with just letting you know what we do when someone comes to us with, with a, an energy issue. So if someone approaches the citizens advice with an energy issue, it's you, usually around billing and uh, paying for energy. So what our advisors do is they investigate someone's bill to make sure that that's correct. First of all, is it to the correct readings? Is it to the correct property? Is it the correct supplier who's, who's, uh, who's issuing this bill? And then once we have looked at liability for a bill, we then look at, you know, coming to a payment arrangement or dealing with arrears that are in place. 
And ways we do that is, first of all, we look at what is someone's ongoing energy usage. So that is what are they using day to day? So we can try and get them a payment plan where they're at least paying their usage. From there, we then look at energy arrears. And there's a number of things we can do that we can uh, negotiate to put that into the payment plan to pay something off the arrears that someone can afford. We can look at grants that are available to potentially write those debts off. Um, so that is what we do with regards to energy advice when someone comes in, so come, someone comes in to see us. So in the Liverpool city region since 2020, we've seen ma major percentage increases in the number of people coming to us with energy related issues. So, and the biggest rises have been this year. Now, unfortunately, we're only three months, we're only three months into this year. So we've only got statistics from the first quarter of this year, but I, I want to put those first quarter statistics in relation to the previous years. And what we have seen, if we look at quarter one in 22, 23, we have seen a 507% increase in people coming to us with energy related issues since 2021. So that just shows the, the you know, the demand that this cost of living crisis is putting on our services and the amount of people who are, who are struggling with energy issues at the moment. Looking at that, of course, April and June are, tends to have milder weather than the winter. So what can we predict for the months of, of November, December and January in, in the height of winter this year? So if we get a similar increase, we're looking at approximately 4,900 people wanting to, wanting to contact us, wanting, uh, wanting energy advice. And this is not taking into account any further rate raising of the cap in October, um, which obviously could happen. And then the, the percentages will go up even more. We're just at the beginning of this crisis as the cap was only raised in, in April. Uh, so this has affected people who are using prepayment med meters immediately as the need for payment went up straight away and they had to, had to, you know, had to change their budget in straight away. But what we're forecasting in the next six months is that the, this crisis will become more acute to people who've got credit meters, which is where you pay on the receipt of a bill or you pay via direct debit because there will be people now who are struggling to meet those price rises who are accruing arrears and inevitably come the winter will be coming to us with wanting us to negotiate to stop fitting a prepayment meters. Um, that being said about the winter, as has been mentioned already, we could well, well, we are looking at the hottest day on record now in England with red, red severe warnings for everyone. And we must not forget the potential en energy costs of keeping cool. There's a lot of stuff on the news at the moment about keeping cool, and but that all costs energy. Um, so that is a, something to think of as well. Looking at the bigger picture, and I know a government aim and is to improve energy efficiency in homes, as we've seen in the previous slides. Um, we provide all our clients who, who come in for energy with an energy efficiency tips and guides, but these can only go so, so far if a house is in disrepair. With the onset of the pandemic, landlords have been increasingly putting off essential repair, and as a result, we've been we've seen big increases in client attending us with housing repair issues, with a 190% rise between quarter one of 2021 and quarter one of this year. And that's got a split between 65% of private rented property and 35% of social housing rented property. So we need to we need to look at the fundamental flaws within our housing to, to bring those houses houses up to up to energy standards. Lastly, I want to just talk about fuel vouchers. Um, so since the onset of the cost of living crisis, we've been issuing fuel vouchers. So these are for prepayment meters only and clients are provided with either £30 in the spring or summer and £49 from the end of October until the end of February. I've only got these statistics for Citizens Advice Liverpool on this, but we've issued 278 vouchers in the past three months, each at £30 and that's through the Fuel Bank uh, Foundation. The, the rise of the fuel voucher is mirroring the rise of the food voucher. So I've been, like I said, I've been giving advice for 20 years and around the 2011 time, that's when 2010 to 2011 was the first time I'd ever issued a food voucher. And I, would like, I wouldn't like to say how many I've issued since that time. And what I'm worried about, you know, I can see that the fuel vouchers are becoming just like the food vouchers were. And are we gonna still be issuing food vouchers in 2034 is it sustainable in the long term? 
you know what what are what are our solutions to the acute energy crisis that people are facing at the moment that's what i wanted to, i just wanted to give you all a, a little flavor of the kind of issues that we are seeing in in the citizens advice and i'm sure that you know that those statistics are from the liverpool city region so they hit all the areas of of uh, of, the, of the region um so thanks for Listening. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. That. There's no doubt we are walking into a, a massive energy crisis coming uh, in the last quarter of, the, of this year. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Uh, but thanks for that contribution. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Guy Jefferson, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Scottish Power. Guy? Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, yeah, so, so Scottish Power Energy Networks, uh, my, my responsibility, our organisation responsibility is for the infrastructure in the uh, Liverpool city region, uh, that being the, the cables, overhead lines, substations that supply energy uh, capacity and resilience to uh, the wider uh, Liverpool city region. We also cover uh, North Wales and we have a licence to operate in central Scotland as well. <coughs> but if I focus on our SP MAMWEB, license area, uh, we have 1.5 million connected customers, whether that be domestic customers, industrial customers, commercial customers in the wider area, uh, covering those um, particular areas I, I mentioned. Uh, largest part of that, obviously, the, is the Liverpool city region and associated customers therein. I think, uh, first of all, my thanks to the Hesseltine Institute for a very interesting paper, which rings very true to us in many areas. I guess our area of expertise is mainly associated with resilience and capacity uh, that's touched on within the paper and uh, delivering that at an affordable price and making sure that it delivers the ambitions of the Liverpool city region in terms of what uh, they want to do to hit their net zero targets in, in 2040, which we're extremely committed to. Liam's going to talk through a little bit of detail of what we've done so far and what we've got underway because we've already started. And uh, my thanks to, to Liverpool City Region for their continued uh, partnership in uh, delivering some of these projects, which we, we've, we're moving at a pace that we're not moving in other parts of the country because of that partnership. And it's really important and I want to stress that, stress that point. Um, we have recently submitted our business plan uh, to our regulator Ofgem. Uh, it's a five-year business plan. It commences in 2023 to 2028. It covers a very important uh, period of time uh, in the um, development of the infrastructure in Liverpool City region to ensure we can head towards 2040 with confidence. Uh, the overall plan is 3.3 billion. And um, that plan it represents uh, a contribution by every customer of 35 pence a day, basically, to, to, to deliver that investment. Uh, that investment covers off, and we've worked very hard with all our communities, including Liverpool City Region, to recognise their ambitions, what they want to do over the next five years, and ensure it's embedded within that plan, uh, which it is. Um, it represents a very small iteration in terms of the annual cost uh, to, to customers in Liverpool City Region. And I recognise the pressure um, families and decisions families are going to have to make in, in the short term with regard to the current energy crisis. Uh, but this represents basically an extra £10 per year uh, to deliver again, the infrastructure that we need to deliver the net zero for 2040, the part that we play in, in that. Um, our concerns at the moment are that um, that plan is now under scrutiny from Ofgem, which it should be, uh, but there's a cut of about 15% in the overall uh, plan at the moment, and it's in, it's in uh, discussion at the moment, and it's out for consultation. And I would encourage uh, those on the call to, to read that on Ofgem's website and get involved in the co consultation, because we believe we need to put that 10 to 15% TOTEX back into the plan to make sure we realise the ambitions that Liverpool City Region and other communities in our, in our territories uh, have for, for uh, net zero. Um, some of that investment is associated with digitalising services to improve customer service and putting in um, new monitoring of our lower voltage networks to ensure that we understand where the load growth is coming and we respond to that appropriately and ensure that the network is resilient in the future and continues to deliver uh, electricity to those who need it and when they need it. 
uh, but also there is um, money that's been reduced around uh, some of our training plans and investment in people that we talked about again uh, as part of our conversation. We've around about 1,700 people will be taken on over the next five years. Uh, a large proportion of that obviously in Liverpool City region and we want to make sure that we're delivering high quality jobs uh, and we're delivering them when they're needed uh, to make sure that the plan gets gets delivered. So we have the only other thing I would say around resilience, and I know Storm Arwen was was uh, was discussed um, from, from a Liverpool City region perspective. I think the the greater threat, if you like, to resilience is the lower voltage networks, the urban networks uh, that we need to continue to monitor, invest in, and uh, ensure are resilient uh, over the next uh, twenty years to to deliver what's re what's required. I agree 100%, it's not just all about putting new network in the ground, it's about making sure that we have proper energy efficiency schemes as well to take away some of the, the, the requirement for power, but also we're operating a smart network which utilises better the network we have in place and we're managing peaks and troughs of load uh, appropriately and all the other technologies, including uh, generation, so that we don't have to put dig up roads and put more uh, cables in the ground where we don't have to we want to it's a combination of different investments uh, and it's important that we recognize that and we manage that appropriately I'm going to hand over to my colleague liam just to very quickly talk through some of the projects that we're we're doing just to bring to life what we do liam uh, thanks guy um as Guy mentioned, as a, at a business level in our business plan, uh, we want to invest over three billion in the, the network in all the areas that we cover over the next uh, five year price control period. But really, what does that mean uh, at a local level? Um, if you just skip forward, I think uh, two slides, please, if that's OK. One more. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I shared a, a, a common view with uh, with Steve about Liverpool being a, an area of uh, of opportunity, and the city region has, uh, for for the reasons Steve mentioned previously, uh, an opportunity not just to uh, to harness um, the ability to transition to net zero, but also to uh, to create uh, an opportunity to create a good, sustainable, green employment for, for the younger generations coming through. And, and I think a number of these projects are, are just some uh, ideas of, of, of what we're able to do uh, to, to facilitate both ambitions, if you like, the, the transition to net zero, whilst also creating employment opportunities for the, for the population, which to some degree will also help some of the issues that Mick quite rightly pointed out in, in his update. So uh, the first uh, project that we'll talk about is the uh, is the regeneration. Um, there's three sort of main areas which you can see on the slide there highlighted uh, in green, numbers one, two, and three, Bootle, Birkenhead, and South Wirral regeneration. Um, and our part to play in those projects is, is around operating the, uh, the network from its current operating voltage of 6.6 .6 kV, so 6,600 volts to 11,000 volts of operation, which um, what we refer to as, as high voltage. Um, this involves uh, basically changing the transformers at 91 substations across Liverpool. Um, this involves using direct staff and contractors, again, uh, and we've had to increase our, uh, our numbers of people in both uh, our direct workforce and our contract workforce in order to deliver that. And as we transition to, to net zero um, over the course of the, the next few decades and, and demand increases, there'll be more need for, for that type of uh, operating and reinforcement scheme. Um, it's good to say, by the way, that that project is, is on, on track. Um, probably the one thing um, that you would probably need to understand is that typically we would undertake that type of project um, with, with a project life cycle from planning to completion of about two to three years. But as a part of the green recovery funding that we were given from Ofgem to, uh, to, to assist with that, um, we were actually targeted in doing that in, in something like 18 months. Now, 
the key to us being able to, to deliver that was the collaborative approach that we've been able to have with uh, organisations such as Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, the local uh, highways, local developers. Um, and uh, the good thing is, is that what it's proven is, uh, as it will in a number of these projects, is that when everybody pulls together and works in that common common goal uh, and pulls in that same, same direction, then, then we can actually deliver these things quicker, faster, and, uh, and to great success. Um, as we mentioned before um, in, uh, in Sue's update there about, um, about housing, um, there's, a, there's two particular projects of note, uh, one in Festival Gardens, and one in the Cowley Hill area of St. Helens, where we're actually working with uh, developments to, to actually build um, greener, sustainable, low carbon housing. Uh, for us, the Festival Gardens project, we're, we're spending 1.8 million to uh, actually install a new uh, double transformer primary substation and uh, also install uh, the necessary 33,000 volt cables to, to feed that uh, development. Again, mentioned on the collaboration point of view, we've been able to work with the developer there who once we uh, once we were able to come to them and, and explain what we were able to do under the green recovery funding, we worked very closely with them to uh, identify the, the substation location because as, as you probably know with infrastructure projects, one of the, the big issues is, is, is obtaining land and securing that for the period of time that you need and and also accessing um, the, the, the road infrastructure when you need to lay cables. But again, um, going back to that collaborative approach that we had, it, we were able to secure that and, and deliver that. And I'm also pleased to report that that project is, uh, is on track. Similar situation with, uh, with Cowley Hill, uh, 1.7 million investment this time, again, building a double primary substation to uh, provide sufficient uh, power for those uh, those homes when they're built to have uh, things like uh, charging infrastructure installed at the properties and and uh, low carbon heating technology already installed at the time of construction, um, and again that project is also uh, equally on track. And then the last specific one that we'll talk about is um, is the provision of electric vehicle charging, and uh, what we've done on that with two notable projects, Headbolt Lane and uh, the newly regenerated Runcorn train station, where we're investing just shy of uh, three quarters of a million uh, to install four new 11,000 volt substations, whose intended purpose will be to allow significant numbers of uh, EV charge points to be installed at those two station locations as a part of reducing the, the carbon footprints of people's commute. So. Um, these things, uh, these things will be uh, common projects as we make the transition to, to net zero. And what I want to, to assure everybody is that we as a business not only understand the significance of, of delivering those projects to, uh, to achieve the, uh, the net zero targets, but also the importance of, of job creation that comes along with that. And I know Steve's talked in the past very extensively about making sure that we harness the uh, significant employment opportunities that the city region has in terms of its fantastic education facilities and really making Liverpool city region a, a center of excellence in terms of not only the transition to net zero from an energy project point of view, but also from the, the, its ability to create sustainable green long-term employment, which is a view I, I absolutely share and, uh, and so do my colleagues in the business. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear that you know, the, the cost of living crisis is having a huge impact on consumers, but as Guy mentioned, one of our key aims through our business plan is to ensure that we deliver that transition to, to net zero at, at the lowest cost to, to consumers and that we don't create situations where consumers or communities are left behind. And, and that's a critical cornerstone of our plan. We're an organization that has always worked in the community, but obviously up until, uh, up until the last decade or so, I think it's fair to say, uh, our role has increased significantly as we become one of the organizations that 
becomes uh, the cornerstone of uh, of delivering net zero whilst also taking its place to uh, ensure that we we boost that economic development for the city region uh, so uh, that that's my uh, that's my comments okay thanks Liam that was a interesting uh, contribution uh, now we've got questions uh, obviously we're all on uh, you know, this is a virtual meeting now uh, so obviously uh, if, if you can put your uh, your questions into into the chat and obviously uh, I'd ask Lewis from the Secretariat to um, obviously read them out as they come through and I'll I'll direct them towards the relevant member of the panel. Uh, so we've got one from Gary here who says, uh, I doubt the viability of high net under the present uh, economic circumstances. He says, natural gas is more expensive than ever before and is mainly imported as a core fuel Using an electrolysis process by which hydrogen is split. We do not have enough renewable to power the process, therefore using fossil fuels. Thirdly, using carbon capture also needs power, which means even more fossil fuels, fuels. The process is being pushed by the oil and gas companies. My question is, is this really a carbon negative project? I'll, 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 I'll throw that, I'll direct that to Steve. Thanks, Jay. Um, I actually think the, the question is in the wrong order. Um, I think the, the likes of the oil and gas companies would quite like to discredit what we're trying to do with HiNet. HiNet is not a new plant um, where fossil fuels will be burnt and through electrolysis that hydrogen will be produced. HiNet is about uh, industries that already exist and produce HiNet uh, and produce hydrogen uh, as a byproduct of their processes. And it's to capture that instead of that going off into the air, it's to capture that. That's the bit that excites me. Um, and in regard to those processes, they produce chemicals that we all need, you know, uh, and pharmaceuticals that we all, all need. Um, so you can't just stop those. So what we need to do is to try to clean them up. And one of the best ways that we could clean some of those industries up is by carbon capture and storage. Uh, we'd prefer not to produce the carbon in the first place. And that's why green hydrogen is really important. And the River Mersey does provide us through hydrolysis an opportunity and electrolysis through, through a, an opportunity to get green hydrogen. But whilst we can't get the green hydrogen immediately, we need to find a partial solution and it's look it's not perfect i've said all along if we're waiting for perfect then it's not going to happen there's there's no perfect solution what we can do though is to look at the best available solution to the problem that we've got now and i noticed as part of the question that as well it was about hydrogen one question hydrogen being used in transport and um in domestic gas supplies that's only because in, in the uh, transport sector, um, yes, it, it doesn't reduce the overall footprint, but for those routes that it will be used on, all you get, the only emission that you get is uh, water vapor. And so it cleans up those routes, but you're right, you know, net, it doesn't save an awful lot, but certainly for those people who uh, live in areas with um, high rates of, uh, um, cardiovascular, you know, pulmonary, um, uh, all, all them sort of diseases, asthmas um, and respiratory disease, all of those sort of things. Yes, it will help, um, but it's not the only solution. So what we're looking at is the best fit for what we've currently got alongside electric vehicles also. Thanks, Steve. Um, next question. Yeah, there's one from Kieran, he can hear. It says, is there much coordination between local stakeholders to improve energy efficiency? Uh, we need everybody on board. I'll, I'll ask uh, Guy for that one, if you want to answer that. Sure, I can contribute, Chair. I'm not an expert in energy efficiency, but I think as in my answer or my comments, I think the important thing is, well, we have uh, network capacity in some areas where we can we can actually connect up some of these uh, green recovery or uh, low carbon technologies quite easily. There are other areas on the on the network where we are already at capacity. <coughs> so as I said, I think energy efficiency 
or smart solutions where we, we move the load, uh, the high peaks of load uh, through the day uh, will free up capacity on the network so we can there, therefore facilitate more um, connection of low carbon technologies. So uh, absolutely, we need to work together to do that. It can't be done um, in isolation. And we have a number of um, pilot schemes that have been completed and been very successful where local developers, um, local authorities and uh, energy networks have worked together to try and get to, to solutions which complement each other. But it's all very well doing pilots. We need to start to build that up and increase the volume because um, you know we're stuck in this constant cycle of pilots of different technologies and it's we don't have any more time for that. We need to push on and that's why we've sought the, the funding to try and do that from our side in, in this business plan that I mentioned in, in my comments. Um, so yeah, very important we work together and, and understand uh, how these uh, technologies can complement each other. Jack, um, can I just ask a question of Sue? Because um, just looking at Sue's uh, fairness slide um, with regard to UK home uh, energy efficiency improvements, there's been a massive decline in lofts and cavity walls insulated from 2012 to a, an all-time low it looks like in 2021. Um, is that because loft insulation and cavity wall insulation is not seen as the most efficient means of driving energy efficiency? Is there a new agenda? Sure. And I, I, I'm, again, I'm not an expert in, in, in the detail of this. I suspect some of the, the reasoning behind this will be linked to funding and grants that were available to promote some of this activity. Because if we think about behaviour change and you know, what are the measures to, that, that are put in place to affect behaviours, I think there has been a big drop for, in, in terms of the funding from, from that perspective. Um, so I think that's one of the... The reasons why um, and I think also um, some of it may be around the ability within the sector to deliver on some of these um, activities as, as I mentioned in, in the slides earlier. Okay, Lewis? Yeah, so, oh sorry, Mike wants to come back. Go on, go on Mike. Uh, just on that from a from a from an advice perspective for energy efficiency because that is a, a major part of our advice that we give when we, we're giving energy advice and obviously we're looking at it from the individual's perspective from their home what can be done to improve the energy efficiency of their home and i think a lot can be done with energy efficiency but messaging is very important um i think there's been a lot of negative news stories about certain things that have gone out that have seemed a bit you know like cuddle a loved one or, or whatever i think if if there's you know there, there are some really good tips to to for energy efficiency but messaging i think is really important without people thinking oh you know you just you don't care kind of thing um just my opinion on that one okay thanks thanks uh, mike uh, lewis i've got a question here from don uh who says in 2020 the heseltine institute provided to the liverpool city region combined authority uh, policy briefing 12 the Liverpool City Region Donut, a means for securing a green and resilient recovery, i.e. the possibilities of an alternative economic model. Do panellists expect any me immediate revisiting and actioning of the opportunities highlighted there? I believe that cities such as Amsterdam are taking those next steps. I've got, I'll come back to Sue on that one. Get on mute. But that policy brief that we published, it, it was very much a provocation about how um, to use a, a donut model of economics to have a relook at the economic approach that cities were taking. And, and there was very much, it was proposing to have a focus on social well-being and environmental sustainability. And in many, and it was set, setting out different measures linked to the sustainable development goals that were being applied, particularly in, in Amsterdam. And, if you look at it, the sentiment of what it was trying to achieve, and if you look at the city region's plan for prosperity, there's a lot of overlap there in the thinking around um, that social well-being angle. Um, maybe what we didn't draw out enough today in the presentation was the environmental sustainability and the biodiversity e examples of how you need to tackle them as part of your economic growth journey as much as that 
social well-being angle, but it's very much a, a provocation to look at different ways of doing this. And, and I would argue we're, we're covering a number of those areas in the city region, but you know we've not mapped them in the same way as Amsterdam have done as part of their donor model. I just want to go to, I want to go back to a point what uh, Steve Brother made earlier this morning. Uh, you know, there's a, obviously there's another election uh, going on here uh, for the leadership of the uh, Conservative Party, and, and then uh, obviously whoever that wins, that will be the Prime Minister. But none of them are talking about green issues, which makes me think uh, they're dragging their heels uh, on the, you know, on, on you know insulation because of the start up costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know. Uh, you know, the, the Maisy Tide uh, Tidal uh, project. You know, when you know when is this government uh, going to uh, you know, actually start saying, yeah, right, we're going to release monies uh, for this project or that project? I think they're scared. They're scared off by the amount of uh, startup costs. That's what we're. What, that's what we're hearing uh, down here. So we've got a significant problem uh, with the green, uh, with green issues with the with the governments. So I think. Uh, from, from an MP's perspective, we need to start uh, asking uh, relevant questions. Uh, you know, what, what are they doing in regards to, uh, you know, reducing carbon, you know, uh, to net zero and things like that? Because you had that uh, Sean Amok uh, uh, saying that he was going to, he was resigned uh, if he couldn't get, if, if he couldn't get them, uh, you know, the, the net zero figures down, uh, what, 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 what he agreed at that, uh, you know, the conference early on this year. So, it is a problem uh, that uh, with the starts up costs. But anyway, I just thought to add that, uh, you know, in the mix. Lewis, next question. Yeah, let's move back to Hynet again. So Nikki says, uh, Hynet suggests hydrogen use includes household heating and local transport, e.g. buses and local delivery vehicles. The scientific community generally agrees insulation and heat pumps or electric vehicles are more efficient. And the former certainly puts more money into the pockets of the people of the Liverpool city region. How can we avoid getting locked into an inappropriate use of hydrogen? Steve, do you want to say? Yeah, I, I, I don't like these binary questions as if like there's a perfect solution to everything that isn't. Uh, I've, I've stated it for many years. So we have to go with what's in front of us and be pragmatic rather than live in a world where we hope that somehow there's going to be a Labour government very, very quickly, um, and then that Labour government are going to be able to invest in stuff that we can build within a couple of years. And, and that's not a reality. Uh, it's certainly a reality that hopefully is going to be a Labour government. But even with the investment um, from a construction background, there's a long leading period of all sorts of, of permissions that you need to get to do any of these things. You know, planning in itself is very complex. And then there's the construction phase in itself. So what we're trying to do is with the pots available to us at present is squeeze as much as we possibly can for the Liverpool city region so that we can do some of the things that we'd like to do and develop some of the infrastructure that if we do have a perfect solution, such as the Mersey Tidal project, which would produce green hydrogen, then we can switch to it. But we're not going to wait until somebody says right okay you can do that now and then try to develop the infrastructure around it so on uh, buses for instance um yes we are looking to um to decarbonize the fleet and we're trialing hydrogen buses um it's only a small proportion of the overall fleet that we have but we'll do that but alongside that we've got a lucky buses as well so we, we, we um, trialled uh, the Pantograph um, charging, um, Alecky charging bus, and we've done all sorts of other things on our trains. Our trains have got batteries, so we're going to try battery power. So we'll be trying all the things that we possibly can, and then we'll plump for the ideal solution for ourselves. Just on uh, domestic gas, very, very briefly, uh, Cadence, uh, uh, the organisation that are doing this, and, it's not here yet. It was going to be in St. Helens, but it's in Cheshire now. Uh, but they're piloting a, a small village to trial it. I think it's up to 20%. They're going to try to see whether they can uh, use hydrogen uh, alongside gas uh, in a mix. And then they'll look at the results of that before it's rolled out any, any further. But as with all of these things, 
Um, you have to prove the uh, the technology before you're liable to get any further investment from both national governments, but also from the private sector as well. And I want the Liverpool City region, as was stated in our innovation prospectus, to become Britain's renewable energy coast. And that means that we have to do these things if we want to be taken seriously. Chair, Chair if I might support sure. Steve, I've got no axe to grind about hydrogen because I run and operate electricity networks, but he's absolutely right that if we just go for one solution, then we'll be still here in 2070. So it's going to take a combination of solutions to, to decarbonise and get us to that 2040 target that we've set out for, for Liverpool City region and the wider target for, for the UK. So, And that's only going to be done if we push hard and look at the project. We'll learn so much from these larger projects as well. Scale projects like this, you'll learn so much from it. And there'll be, there'll be some of the technologies you're testing will help us in other areas. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we don't put all our eggs in one basket because uh, ultimately some of these uh, solutions may fail and, uh, you know, and, and it will take far too long if, if we were just to rely on electricity networks because we can't possibly do it all uh, in that 2040 timescale. Okay, thanks, Guy. Lewis? Yeah, so I'm from Jane Corbett here. It says, following on from Mick's presentation, what do SPEN see their role is to ensure households can afford to pay for energy from September and October onwards? Mike, uh, Mike from Citizen Advice. Well, I think the question is there is to uh, Scottish Power, Scottish Power yeah. uh, SPEN there, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'll Liam. Yeah. Um, I think I think our, our role in that is is pretty clear. It, it's it's to to deliver what we we said we were going to deliver the way we said we we're going to deliver it in our business plan. We've clearly laid out, as Guy mentioned before, what that means in terms of you know the the cost of delivering that plan. But for me, the real fundamental issue that will affect customers is the is the cost that would happen if we don't deliver it. Is the, is the possibility that they get left behind in terms of the, that important transition. It's the, the impacts of not making the investments we need to ensure that we continue to build that strong, reliable energy supply to create employment, to make sure that customers have the energy available to them to in order to heat their homes, in order to, to get to work, in order to continue their lives in a, in a prosperous way. So for me, um, from an SP Energy Networks perspective, our role is very clear. It's, it's, it's do what we said we were going to do in the plan, in the timescales that we said we we're going to do it and deliver it to the, to the quality and, and the level that customers expect. And I think the real risk for us is, is not achieving that as opposed to, uh, to the reverse of that question, which is purely from a, an economic one. Guy, I don't know yeah. if you want to add anything to that. Just to add to that, Chair, because the thrust of the question may well have been the short term, the difficulties which are severe, as, uh, as Mick uh, painted at the start of the conversation. Uh, we are a, a network, um, so, so we build and uh, deploy networks. We're not a retailer, but we still for any future plans, we need to keep our costs down and make sure that if there are any increases, they're minimal. As I've said before, for the next five years, it's a equivalent to about £10 a year per person to, to realise those investments that will, that will make good on the ambitions for, for 2040 for LCR. Also, in the short term, we do talk to customers every day who are connected to our network and we have um, you know, we signpost them to <coughs> those that are particularly vulnerable to services that are provided by the likes of Mick and, and the local authorities to make sure that they, they that any help that is out there, then we make sure they can get signposted to it and understand it's there and what it can do for them. Um, I think for, we're not a retailer, but we do have a retailer in our organisation and I think our chief executive is well known for calling for more government support um, special, especially for vulnerable customers. Uh, we've seen some support, but we really need more, given, as we said before, that the likely uh, charges for, for energy is going to go up again uh, in October and over that winter period. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's that's our contribution. Thanks, Guy. Lewis? I'm going to bundle two questions together here. So we've got one from, I think it's Margaret Greenwood, MP, who says, uh, when you say that Mersey Tidal could generate enough for up to 1 million homes. What does enough mean? 
Does this include domestic heating as well as lighting, cooking and appliances? And then there's one from Michael Cross who says, will all new build homes in LCR be carbon neutral? Do you need a change in the planning rules to make this happen? I'll go to Steve on that one. Just trying to get myself off mute. Uh, it's a nightmare than this sometimes. Um, so on the, the, the first one, we're saying it, that there's enough generated for a million homes. So yeah, that, that's for the, uh, the energy usage in an individual domestic property. So there's enough, and it, there could be enough for that. It depends on the scheme. And, and Martin Land, uh, who's also on this call chair, might be able to answer any of the technicalities around it. It depends what project we plump for. And at this moment in time, we've got a number of options that we have to look at uh, as part of the business case, because that's the way the government are directing us. And the Green Book, as you know, only considers 45 years of production of that energy when the whole thing will be here for 120 years or so. So um, it's, a, it's a flawed way of trying to calculate the viability of something. But what we could do is if we um, went for one option, it could be up to a million homes. So that's why we say up to a million homes because we don't have any option. Um, the second one was on passive house um, standards and that's for Liverpool City Council. They have bid for some brownfield funding from the combined authority. That's to remediate the land. So then it does become commercially viable to build housing on it. Um, if anybody knows the Festival Garden site, it was a, a former refuse tip. And so they're literally getting rid of all of that, which is producing, by the way, lots and lots of, of uh, methane um, as stuff rots. So they're getting rid of that finding um, uh, the best way, the best solution to, um, to recycling uh, as much of that as possible. But then the ground will be readied for the development. And I don't think that they've currently let the, um, the, the, the plots go yet to uh, developers. So I think that's something that we uh, need to ask Liverpool City Council uh, about. I think Jane Corbett's actually on the call and she might be able to give us some more information on that. Okay, I'll, I'll just ask, uh, does Mark, Mark, Martin want to make a contribution? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think, I think, as Steve said, on the Tidal project, we've got a number of options and they can be at different sizes. Um, the, the idea of converting it to a number of homes is the same uh, sort of expression that the wind farms and everyone use. So uh, it, it, it's based on a you know, an average uh, consumption. Uh, I think the one thing that we're, we're finding more and more about the tidal project is because the tidal come in every night, uh, you know, it comes in and out twice a day, um, we'll always be able to charge our electric vehicles. And, you know, that's not in the question. So we'll be almost in the position where we can say to everyone, please charge your electric vehicle when the tide comes in. Now, you, you think about the complexity of time of use tariffs and, and how they used to work for mobile phones between peak periods and off peak periods. If I just say, OK, you know, here's the tide for the next 18 years. That's when I want you to charge your car. Um, spend need to build a, a network that's resilient, but generally overnight has capacity uh, because, you know, we use a lot less electricity at night. So, so the tidal scheme, um, yes, it'll help electrification. Yes, it'll help um, electric vehicle charging. And remember that electric vehicle charging can then feed back to the grid uh, in the morning at a peak period if people chose to do that. Uh, so we wouldn't be, um, you know, we wouldn't be taking the benefit of that charge in uh, personal, you know, EV users will take the charge. Uh, but that could be a huge benefit in the future because, you know, if we had 400,000 vehicles, electric vehicles in the city region, that's 400,000 uh, vehicles that you know maybe a quarter of them would need charging uh, on a nightly basis you know you don't fill your car up with petrol every night but um you won't fill your electric vehicle up every night you know about every fourth night every you know once a week you'll um fill it up and tidal will be able to do that so yes it's heat yes it's cooking um and, and yes it's electric vehicles and you know part of the flexibility of people managing how they take their electricity in the future as we come off fossil fuels just be so important for us all and that, that'll require a behavioral change as well 
Okay, Th thanks, Martin. Uh, Jane, would you like to make a contribution? Thanks, Mick. Um, I'll find out the exact answer for you. I'm just trying to see who asked it, so I can't see who asked it. Who asked the question, Mick? It was, it was, it was Steve. Oh, it was Steve. No, but somebody else asked the question in the chat, I think. Lewis? No, sorry, I'm reading the other one about the passive home standards. Is that what the question was, Steve? I was doing two things at the same time. OK, I'll come back to Steve direct. I've got a meeting on Friday. I'm coming to you, Steve, so I'll let you know then. OK. That, that is, I mean, that is the answer. You know, all, all of the energy efficiency stuff, that, that is the way forward. And if it's passive home standard, then suddenly we're into a whole different different ball game. If you look at the core city stuff that, uh, that is happening at the moment, that is the, the, the big push. So you, you're spot on. It's the right question to ask. We need to get the right answer. OK, thanks. Thanks, Jane. Lewis? Yes, we've got one again from another one from Margaret. He says that um, one idea that's been suggested to me is that of using thermal image cameras uh, to demonstrate to people where heating is being lost from their homes. People would be able to see homes like their own and start thinking about uh, what they can do to cut their own energy consumption. Uh, it seems to me that this could be something that LCR could run an exhibition on, along with showcasing solutions for reducing heat loss from buildings. Is that something you sh uh, could consider doing, Steve? Steve, yeah. Yep, um, that's a great question. And, and, and of course, um, uh, that sort of technology is all around. You've seen it yourself. And, and that's why we've been able to determine from the types of properties, the heat loss from them using thermal imaging. Um, so those infrared cameras are, are, are brilliant. Um, how we do it, could we do it? Yes. How we do it and what um, the benefits that we derive from it um, would need to determine, wouldn't we? Because it wouldn't just, you know, we identify the issue, but what could we do to put it right? Actually, what we need is we need a um, greater share of the, the funding that's available because nearly two thirds of the properties in the, the Liverpool City region um, have poor energy efficiency. So we could make a, a big dent in the carbon output uh, from our area in fact it would save about a third of our uh, net um, carbon output um, by doing the uh, the properties to a decent standard so whereby they've got insulation uh, double glazing um, and energy efficiency boilers or uh, heat exchange pumps so it's something that i'd like to do i've been to one that we've done actually um, and it, it, they are absolutely fantastic the person who was living there said that they were saving, this is before prices went up, they were saving £25 a week. That's probably 30 quid a week now, which um, our friends from um, who know about benefits will tell, tell you is a huge amount of money to somebody who's living on the breadline. How much are the, what's, what's a, you know, a ballpark figure for a heat pump? Six grand? Oh, well, the, the actual package for a property is about 10 grand, 11 grand. So that's all of the interventions that they need to get it to the right standard. Um, that's on average, of course, it depends on the size of the house, when it was built, whether it's had um, stuff already done to it, et cetera, et cetera. But that's about a ballpark figure. Yeah, that's, but that, you know, that's gonna rule a hell of a lot of people out. They, they just nope. can't afford without government's assistance. Yeah, yeah we're, we're doing that, Mick. They're, they're the ones that we've picked and we've picked um, the areas that have the least energy efficient properties first. And for those people um, who are um, probably in most need of help. Okay, thanks Steve. Lewis? Yeah, so I'm gonna bundle two more questions. Uh, they're, they're both Look, two. I'm not two more questions. I'm just looking at the time. I've got, I've got, I've got to go to a meeting uh, shortly. So we'll take uh, two more questions and All then right. we'll wrap it up. Okay. okay. Yeah, so these are both to Scottish Power. So there's one uh, from Mick Wynn who says, with energy bills already increased by 54% on average, and this is likely to increase, has the actual cost of supplying energy to households increased by the same amount? I'm excited for renew renewable energy and carbon neutral, but are the costs of reinvesting for this being fully passed on to the consumer? And then there's one from Richard Katz uh, from Glass Futures who says, Glass Futures aim is in St. Helens are to reduce preferably eliminate carbon from glass and other foundation industries. By replacing high carbon natural gas with alternative sub, uh, sustainable energy sources, 
such as green electricity, liquid biofuels, green hydrogen, etc. How can Scottish Power assist? Liam? I'll, uh, I'll take the last question, if, if that, the, the second part of that question. I think Guy's probably better placed to answer the first one. So um, in terms of how we can assist Glass Futures, uh, that's very simple. That's uh, collaboration, understanding you know, what, a, what it is, uh, the various initiatives that you describe uh, are trying to achieve, and then looking at what network requirements we, we may need to provide to, to facilitate that. And, as I mentioned earlier, that is what I see our, our key role is, is that enabler of, uh, of net zero ambitions. And it's very clear that Glass Futures have got uh, significant plans there. And I, I think the, the key thing there is get engagement with ourselves at the earliest opportunity, both parties understanding not only the plan, but what steps need to be taken to achieve that and, and, and that clarity and communication between the two organization and then and then agreeing a way forward and, and getting on and delivering it. That, that, that's, that, that, that's how I see SPEN assisting Glass Futures in, uh, in delivering that ambition. Guy, if you want to deal with the first uh, question. Yeah, yeah, Chair, I can answer that very quickly. Um, in terms of the increasing costs associated with the transmission of electricity, which is the activity we do, no, it's not in line with that 54%. As I said before, it's it's about 10 pounds extra from next year. Uh, the the cost of uh, uh, our part of the bill hasn't changed up until now at all, but from next year, if our proposals are approved by Ofgem, then that would go up by 10 pounds per customer per year. Um, simple as that, which is around about just under 10%. Thanks, Guy. Uh, Lewis, last questions? Uh, well, Richard Katz has got his hand up, so I don't know whether he wants to come back on that. Thank you. No, I wasn't directly coming back. I was trying to shut my hand down. Uh, it <laughs> wouldn't go down, but it has now. Um, but can I just say overall, um, I think this is a very, very useful uh, collection of thought pro provoking uh, discussions. Um, uh, Glass Futures is a relatively new boy on the block in uh, the Liverpool region, and we are determined to make a really major difference. Um, I, I will look forward to talking to, to Liam and Guy on uh, energy issues. Uh, we are really at the top end of our capability or capacity, shall I say. Uh, and one other thing to, for everybody's knowledge is that um, we are planning uh, next year when our uh, uh, innovation center is uh, up and running to be uh, manufacturing our own green hydrogen um, in addition to the blue hydrogen which will be uh, uh, coming our way eventually on the pipeline but we don't want to wait for blue hydrogen to be available uh, and our installation on green hydrogen certainly for our own experimentation but also for other foundation industries, um, uh, uh, this is a, a significant investment from Glass Futures standpoint, helped by government, uh, helped by um, uh, Liverpool Combined Authority, um, all of which is here to help the region. And I wasn't expecting to have an opportunity to talk, so thank you very much. <laughs> You've got a very compliant year. <laughs> but if I could just make sure may closing remarks then i think everyone has found us as you said richard you know very this has been very rewarding and a timely discussion and it's something that we'll obviously need to revisit uh, and undoubtedly uh, we're going to be a very challenging uh, there's going to be a very challenging few months ahead uh, you know with the energy uh, costs etc etc you know that's going to be really really challenging and i just want to thank uh, you know in particular sue steve mick Guy and Liam, and Liam for joining us today, and Devo Connect for acting as our secretariat, and of course, to all our sponsors, and to everybody else who joined us here today. Thank you very much. And I'll just remind everybody, the next session is uh, on the, is, it's going to be on housing, and housing issues, and it's going to be scheduled in for the 19th of October. And obviously, we'll be looking forward to seeing Kim back in the chair. So thank you very much for attending, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.